So we're going to continue on our, our healing adventure with Jesus. Is that good? And so, you know, last week we, we, we started out in Matthew chapter 8, and we talked about just the different ways that, that Jesus released healing. And so we know he, the leper came up to him and said, you know, Jesus, if, if you want to heal me, you can. And again, it wasn't that the leper questioned whether or not God could heal. He was just wondering if he would actually do it for him. And again, in that his case, he was considered an outcast, kind of a, a lesser than anything, and then just... But Jesus, in who he was, again, he was a lawbreaker because he fulfilled it, right? And so he came, and as he touched the man, he then spoke the word, be healed. And so that's one of the ways that Jesus heals, right? It's, it's, it's through the, the, the touching and the laying on of hands and then his spoken word. And again, that command, he was speaking literally to the infirmity, be healed, he was calling another realm that's in the heavenly places to the earth. And again, that's the power of our proclamation. Again, you know, uh, earlier Patty mentioned that our, that our words have power. You know, in the, in the weeks to come, and we, we've done several prophetic classes, but I think we'll teach in some, some simple ways of, of hearing the voice of God and, again, just the power of our words in, in, in the weeks to come. I just feel like... We just all want to get on the same page with this because to me, the beautiful thing is that God really is pouring out his spirit. Even as we were proclaiming that song into the atmosphere, it became more than just a song. I could begin to feel just like the Holy Spirit going, yeah, come on, there's people getting hungry. And to me, again, we know that hunger it does something with the realm of the kingdom. It, it, it awakens, one, the reality of what's available to us and the reality of what's already on the inside of us. And so in that... Um, I just really feel like, you know, we're, we're going to learn the power of our words, that when we make a decree, things will happen, they'll be established, so that light can shine upon our way. And so, again, even in healing, and we're going to go into this a little bit more in depth next week, because we're going to kind of, I'm just going to lay out, and I'll, I'll call it a model of healing, but to me, it's just some practical, I will say, on-ramp ways to just release healing, okay? So, like, when you're going... You know, I mean, you just go, what? No, how do I? okay, I'll just do that first. So we're going to do that next week. Um, and, and part of it, we'll do some activation today too, but I really want to go into in-depth just ways that we can release the reality of God's healing hands and healing heart in and through you. So, But this week, we're going to continue on the adventure of just the different ways that Jesus healed, as we see in Scripture. And in particular, we're focusing on Matthew chapter 8, 9, and then onward into 10. So... And then we, we see the next thing after he, uh, after he came down and cleansed the leper, he came to the centurion, right? And the centurion had a, had a servant that was tormented and paralyzed and all of that. And he, Jesus was like, I'll go to your house. And he was like, no, 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 no. Just say the word, Jesus, and my servant will be healed. And so we know that even in, in the place of distance, see, the spirit realm has no no hindrance to who we are in the realm. You know what I'm saying? Even on uh, Tuesday, I was on a Zoom call with our friends in Southeast Asia. I won't, show, won't mention the exact location, but we, we had a healing service. And even on that, again, I can't even see, like, the thousands of people that are on. I mean, I just see just the, the small group. There was probably, like, 20 faces I could actually see. But there was thousands that were on this call. And there was a gentleman who was blind in his right eye, had a word of knowledge. Some must have an issue with their right eye, and I feel like there's even pain in it right now. And then someone puts in the chat, yeah, that's me. We prayed for him. Sight was completely restored. So we just spoke the word, you shall be healed. And you know, we, we did a, some of this teaching, actually. Just, and it, what it does is it awakens faith, and that's what God wants to awaken in us, that every single one of us, if we've confessed Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, guess what? We get to do the stuff. And what's the stuff? Just read the Gospels, that kind of stuff. And actually, Jesus even promised, I'm going to go to the Father, and when I do, I'm going to pour out the Spirit. Father's going to pour out the Spirit, and you're going to do greater things than these. So, like, when you read the Gospels and you read the different things that Jesus did, the miracles he did, guess what? And it wasn't, when he said greater things, it wasn't like a greater quantity. I'm talking unusual-type miracles, now, I, I got a really crazy story. There's this lady that we prayed for, and uh, she actually, what, what's that? Oh, this, I have a lot of crazy stories. But so, so we're praying for this lady, and she, she can't even bend. Like, this is it. And then she, she starts, like, pain. 
like tearful pain. And so we just came up and were praying for her. I felt like lightning bolts. It's so weird. I felt like lightning bolts come out of my hand and zap this lady in a really good way. Again, lightning of God are wonderful, okay? And as I was, I was, I was releasing just the Father's heart and the healing into, and speaking into her back, I mean, she begins to feel the electricity. So then, so then what I did is I asked, so, so tell me exactly what's going on. I should have usually done that. I usually do that first, but it was like I just, let's go. You know what I mean? And so, again, we'll lay out some of the, the model of healing, and we'll call it a model just because, again, it's an on-ramp. But I, I asked her, I said, so what happened? She goes, seven years ago, um, I was in a car accident broke several of my vertebrae, I have two titanium rods, like, literally in her back. Like, that's why she could only bend this far. Because, like, metal doesn't bend real good. I don't know if you all know that. You know what I'm saying, Indy? <laughs> metal doesn't bend real good. And so we, we prayed for her. And immediately as she was feeling that, that electricity, like, the pain that she was feeling moments before, she was like, wow, the pain's gone. And so she's elated with that. You know, sometimes we don't understand that when someone who has chronic pain or wakes up every day with a chronic headache, that when they get healed, sometimes, ah, oh, yeah, whatever. No, to me, a cough or a headache takes just as much faith as raising the dead. And sometimes we categorize things because of our lack of faith. Oh, God, do you really think he can do that? Yeah, he can do that. Trust me, he can do amazing things in and through you. In fact, he wants to. And so we're praying for this lady. And all of a sudden, again, she's just feeling, now she's feeling the heat. And she's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. She goes, whoa. And all of a sudden, I, I said, do something you couldn't do. She was already doing this. So she, I said, do something you couldn't do. And she goes, I am, I am. You don't understand, I am. I haven't been able to do this for seven years. I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. She's got two titanium rods in her back, and now she's bending. And I thought, what? And then all of a sudden, she reaches here. She goes, I, I go, what's going on? She goes, I, I'm feeling... But not only that, the battery in my butt is gone. And I thought, the battery in your butt? Like what? I didn't even know people had batteries in their butt. But she goes on to tell us that, yeah, the battery in my butt, because what had happened is the nerves had been so pinched that she had what's called flop foot. And basically, her, when she would walk, you know, her foot, would, you know how we walk? We can do this. Her foot wouldn't do that. So she actually had this battery that when she would move her foot forward, ew, ew. You know what I'm saying? So, like, literally the motion would cause that little thing to fire to cause her foot to lift up. And so she goes, the battery in my butt is gone. And she goes, look, I can walk. I can walk. So she's, like, freaking out. You know, again, I didn't know the extent until really after, after we were done praying for her, I'm going, dang, that's something. I don't know how many batteries in people's butts Jesus dissolved. I mean, he did that one, of course. It was him working through me. But I thought, wow, that's a greater thing than these, right? And even the idea that there would be metal in someone's back, I don't think that was done back in biblical times. That, again, I don't know. I wish I would have had a, you know, like a metal detector. You know what I mean? Just, to, just to, let's find out. This, you know what I mean? Whatever. The point is, is that this lady's doing this. So I don't know if all of a sudden that titanium became pliable, and now it's, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know. All I know is that God's good. And he's doing extraordinary, unusual miracles through the hands of his sons and daughters. To me, this is so exciting. I'm telling you, a life in Christ is not boring. Because if it is for you, then you're not serving the Jesus that I know. You have a form of godliness, but deny his power. And unfortunate, you know, a lot of the church is in that place, right? Well, we have the form but deny the power that's available to us to do the things that Jesus did. And not only what he did, it's what he's doing. Because, as we said last week and the week before, Jesus is the same yesterday. Let's do that again. Jesus is the same. No, yesterday. No, okay, wait a minute. Jesus is the same. Come on. That's so good. So don't ever question that. Again, he is the healer. That's his very name. It's his very nature. It's, it's, it's not what he does. It's who he is. He is the healer. I am the Lord God that heals you. Yahweh Rapha. Come on. And the fact that he lives inside of you. Mm-hmm. Amen. 
That's the battery. There you go. Supercharged with Holy Ghost supernatural power. And again, it's that place of abiding in the vine, and that as we abide in him, he's already abiding in us, and we just create more room for him the more that we just allow his love to transform us. And to me, that's what, that's what just being hungered for him does, is it increases and expands our heart, it increases and expands our capacity to do the things that Jesus did. Okay. So again, we, we, we speak the word, and they shall be healed, Right? You know, I, I think I sh- might have shared another, again, times on these Zoom calls. It's like the, the one kid that didn't have an eardrum in his left ear. And I, I had a word in all. Someone's got something going on in their left ear. And I just made the declaration. I just command right now. And I, as I spoke, I said, I just right now, I speak, he- I speak into the, to the hearing. I speak into the, to the eardrum now in Jesus' name. And this kid writes in the chat, um, I didn't have an eardrum in my left ear, and now I can hear. Did he get a new eardrum? Probably. Because God is up to all kinds of good, the creative miracles. You know, we, we showed the story last week with, with uh, the guy we prayed for in Taiwan that didn't have an eyeball and now does. I mean, Jesus, you're so good. There was this other guy that we prayed for, and he was in one of our classes, and he had sent me a text earlier today and said, bro, pray for me, man. I'm in the, I'm in the hospital. And what a, what a, he, had a, he works construction. He was working in some area where there was like up in an attic where there was some mold and mildew and stuff. And he got that stuff in his lungs like the day before that and ended up getting like pneumonia. Not like pneumonia. He got, he got pneumonia. And so he was in the hospital like in all kinds of pain. And, and so he sends me the text. I said, yeah, dude, I'll be praying for you. Well, he shows up at class that night. And then, I mean, the dude looked really bad, actually. Like he looked really sick. Like his, his skin was grayish. I mean, all of the just life like taken out of him. You know what I'm saying? He was in a lot of pain. You know, the doctors are like, dude, you got to stay in the hospital. He's like, no, I need to go. I need to go to church tonight. <laughs> Come on. You know, sometimes we can say, yeah, I'm not feeling well. I'm not going to go to church today. That's the exact place you need to be going. You know what I'm saying? And so, so he comes to, to, to class that night, and I'm like, Richard, what are you doing here? He goes, I just had to be here. God told me if I come, I'll get healed. I said, I like that. Come on now. And so what was interesting, he went on to share that as they took x-rays that morning, they had seen, of course, the, the pneumonia in his lungs, right? And then what they also found were these spots. And he goes, they think it's cancer. And I said, they think it's cancer. Hmm, okay. And then he goes, and another thing they found is, because he, he's always got back, he said, I always have back pain. He goes, well, I found out why. He goes, I've got three discs that are so degenerated. He goes, man, you got a back of an 80-plus-year-old person. He's like, what do you mean? He goes, like, three of your discs are so degenerated, I can't believe you're even walking. And he's like, well, even that's a miracle, you know what I'm saying? So we proceeded to just gather around Richard. We laid hands on him. We just commanded right now, breath of God. I mean, that was like the, we just command that breath of heaven to enter into the lungs. <sighs> just enter now. We just, we rebuke this pneumonia. We command life into these lungs and we bind and forbid that devil of cancer out in Jesus' name. And then we just said, all right, Lord. And then from that, we just laid his hand on him. Like he felt like liquid love. The healing lava of heaven going down his spine. He's like, and he coughed violently for a moment. And I'm like, oh, here goes that devil. Like, for real, that devil of cancer went, boom. And we just went, boom, get out of here. So he, he, go, he goes to the doctor again the next day because he's like, I feel great. I mean, that night, I mean, like, all of the color came back in his skin and just life entered his body. Again, even as the doctor spoke, and again, words have and sometimes doctors, they're giving a diagnosis, but sometimes they go beyond the diagnosis and they begin to make a, a, a declare over someone that just isn't true. Because the truth is we're healed by his stripes. See, facts are different than truth. Fact is, he actually had spots in his lungs. Fact is, he actually had degenerative disease. Fact is, he actually had pneumonia. Truth is that by the stripes of Jesus Christ, he was healed. And that's the truth for every one of us. If we're dealing with any kind of struggle, again, healing that needs to take place in our body or in our soul, right? And, of course, when we're born again, 
our spirit comes to life and is completely healed. And so he goes back to the doctor the next day. They do x-rays again. He goes, doc, you got to do x-rays again because, like, I feel really good. He goes, like, this doesn't make any sense. And so they took x-rays, and he put them up side by side, and he goes, you know, if I wasn't the one that took these x-rays yesterday, I would never believe what I'm looking at right now. And he goes, so, he goes, yeah, I went to church last night. And Jesus healed me. He is like, what? He goes, yeah, I went to church last night, and Jesus healed me. The cool thing is that all of the pneumonia was gone. All of those cancerous spots in his lung were completely gone. And he had three brand new discs in his back. Come on. I'm telling you, creative miracles, man. We're in that season right now where God is going to do some amazing things. You know, and I love revival history and even what we saw in this nation at the turn of the 20th century in Azusa Street in in Los Angeles. And, I mean, crazy, amazing signs, wonders, and miracles. You know what I'm saying? I mean, where this, this dude didn't have a limb and... William Seymour, it's interesting because he, he, William Seymour was a one-eyed guy. Seymour. You know what I'm saying? He saw more than what we can see. I'm just saying. I, I, was, I just thought that. That's kind of funny. Seymour, a one-eyed guy. Anyway, anyway, William Seymour lays hands on this guy. and Okay, maybe he didn't do that. Where there wasn't an arm, there was an arm. You know, when we see Jesus doing that same miracle, right? He's in the synagogue, sees a guy with a shrivel up. Come on now. <laughs> miracle grow. And I'll tell you what, miracle grows on the inside of you and wants to get out. And so I just believe that that's part of the season we're in. And to me, that God will always back up his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. And that when we understand this Christ that is inside of us, you know, like in Acts 10, 38, it says, And God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. That's the truth for you. You've been anointed. The thing is, we actually get to take up this banner that Jesus uh, proclaimed, actually, in Luke. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. Luke chapter 4, right? We've been anointed to be ones that bring good news, bind to the broken heart, set captives free, restore sight to the blind. Every one of us has been anointed to do these things and even greater things. I'm telling you, we're in a season of the greater things. Moving onward. We're doing a summary here. So at, uh, verse 14, it says, Now when the Sabbath had ended, they all went over to Peter's house. His mother-in-law was sick in bed. She didn't go to the synagogue. I'm mean, like, come on, mama, let's go. You know what I mean? But, but Jesus came over to her house. She was sick, right? And it says that then Jesus just grabbed her by the hand. He didn't, he didn't say anything. He just went, just grabbed and just took her by the hand. She was laying there, fever. And the fever left. Jesus didn't speak to it. Jesus just released the reality that was flowing in and through him and just went, there ain't no place for fear. And he became a conduit to love, moved by compassion of the Father. And as he did, it just entered into the mother-in-law and found its way out. (laughs) Yes. And to me, that, that is the beauty of the kingdom, is that we get to be the conduits to his love, his grace, and his power. I mean, isn't that amazing? I said, you know, God's not building containers. He's building conduits with faucets wide open. Let's go. Don't be turning that thing off, plugging things up. God wants to clean our pipes so we can be that fire hose of glory everywhere we go. You know what I mean? And just sprinkle love everywhere we go. You know, again, you know, the, again, the beautiful thing about Jesus that, you know, we, we mentioned last week with, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 
10, part B, it says, and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And again, when we testify, and even as we were sharing testimonies, and again, we're going to make that a regular thing. And so again, how many of you did homework this week and found it, went out and shared, shared the, the love of Jesus wherever you went? Did you have some cool miracles happen? Seriously, did you? Okay, okay. I'm telling you, we're, we're, we're going to find next week, we're going we're to share some of those testimonies because that's what I want is I want every one of you to just go out and be the light of Christ wherever you go. And heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. Because freely you receive, now just freely give it away. And to me, again, that's the abiding in, in the vine component. That as we just trust him and lean into him, you know what I mean? You know, I just, I like what... That Jesus and his, who he was, just demonstrating just the love of the Father, right? And in, in John, actually this is in uh, Third John, First John actually, 3.18, or 3.8. It says, for this purpose the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. To do what? Destroy the works of the devil. And guess what? That same Christ lives inside of us. Get to what we get to do. We get to destroy the works of the devil. You know what I mean? It's so good. And literally, our, our very presence when we come into places whoo, disrupts darkness. It just does. And that's part of why God really wants us to understand who we are in Christ. That's why he wants us to understand our true supernatural identity, who we are as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Because the devil will come after how you think about yourself. That's how he'll attack you. How do you see yourself in Christ? Well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am more than a conqueror. I am a son of the Most High God. And you begin to prophesy the truth of who you are, telling the devil goes, oh, man, they're getting it. Dang. You know what I mean? And he just kind of backs off. Again, resist the devil. And guess what? What does he do? He flees. So resist that bugger. Talk to the hand. And that's why it's important that even when the devil comes with his noise, again, the idea is keep every thought captive. Just because it's a thought doesn't mean it's yours. Give it back to the devil, man. Poof. Give it back. It'll go well with you. It'll go real well with you. So Peter's mother-in-law gets healed. And then it says that when even he had come, everyone gathered at the front door. And those who were demon-possessed got healed. Those who had disease were completely healed. Those who were paralyzed were healed. That's so cool. So don't shut the front door. Open the front door and let them in. <laughs> Let's go. You know what I'm saying? We, we had a, can you put the, the picture of uh, Varys laying down on the mat? And so this guy here, this is over uh, in Ghana, Africa, where, where we've got our, our, our base over there. And so Varys had had a stroke, <laughs> went completely paralyzed. Like the dude couldn't move at all. I mean, he could move his mouth, he could talk a little bit, but lot, everything slurred. And so, in, in this hand, because it was, it was just crunched down like that, um, his wife put, somehow got it pried open, put a lemon in there. So he was like squeezing this lemon. I thought, there's no way to squeeze a lemon. Fresh lemonade, anybody? You know what I mean? But, but I mean, he was like, just, you know what I mean? And so we just said, you know what, this is not okay. So they explained, you know, he had gone to the hospital, they could do nothing for him. Isn't that something? That when the doctors can't, the great physician shows up and does. Man. And so we, we just started praying for him. And he, a, li a little loosening with his hand, but all of a sudden, poof, one little kick. And that was it. I thought, oh, we got this. And that's all we saw that day. And I said, oh, we're coming back tomorrow. Prayed in tongues some more. Came back the next day. And as we were there listening, he's now sitting up, leaning up against his hut. And I thought, what is this? And the wife goes, yeah, it's so crazy. In the middle of the night, I woke up, 
And there was Varys sitting up. And I said, why are you sitting up? He goes, because I can. I'm thinking, come on now. You know, and again, we release the anointing, we release God's healing, and God continues to heal. Again, it goes back to the thing called the working of miracles. And sometimes we want the microwave, and sometimes God does do that. I'm telling you, I've seen it both. But there's sometimes that you need to be paying attention to the whispers of the Father. Keep going. In fact, go back there again tomorrow. And it's not, it's not loud. And then you got the devil going, yeah, see, I told you he wasn't going to walk. Ain't no way he's ever going to walk again. I've got him. And you heard that noise too? And the father goes, just go back there tomorrow and watch what I do. So which voice are you listening to? Sometimes the loudest voice ain't the one you should be listening to. In fact, rebuke that devil. Get him out of the way. And so we come back the next day. And we, we, we pray, oh, my gosh, there he is. He's already up. That's what happened. <laughs> so we prayed for him again, and all of a sudden, strength, and his legs are vibrating. And he's like, ah, his toes are, you can feel the big poking on his feet. And, and then we, we just kept, kept praying for him. I kept praying for him. And then and next thing you know, I was like, all right, let's, let's get him up. And I think Chad and I each grabbed him by an arm, and we just started to walk with him, just like you would a baby. Because like, like, here's the deal atrophy, everything. There was no, like, no muscle strength at all. But as soon as we got him up and he started to, to vibrate and, and walk with each little step, it was like all of a sudden strength began to enter in. And I was just like, oh, come on, Jesus, come on. And then you know, we, we, we come back again the next day, and now he's literally, hey, how you all doing? I got my stick. I just got to keep a little balance here. I got a, my, my toe is still a little sore. But, you know, I mean, come on, Jesus. Doctor says he'd never walk again. The great physician had a different thing. And again, what voice are we listening to? Again, I love doctors, but sometimes their prognosis doesn't line up with the reality of heaven. And that when we become the great physician assistants and we assist with the anointing and allow that love, grace, and power to flow in and through us, miracles happen. Whew. Man, it's so so amazing. So again, man, I, I'm looking forward to this. You know, when, again, when you look at Jesus, it says that no, he didn't heal everyone that he, he encountered. Does that make sense? Everyone that actually came to him, he healed. And so there's, so there's a difference in that too. That and we, we talked a little bit about that last week that I'll ask the question, what do you want? Oh, anything that God wants, whatever his will is. And I said, that's not what I asked. What do you want? If you could leave from this place today with one thing, what would it be? And as soon as they say the thing, there's a whole dimension of faith that gets released for the situation and circumstance that's going on. Well, I need it all. I said, but what do you want right now? Oh, you don't understand. I got pain. I got da 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 I said, on that list, if there's one thing that you could actually have some relief from, what would that be? And then we just watch God. And then many times, right down the list, he'll go. But to me, it just takes with that one that first, that first miracle, right? That first whew, wind of his presence. And then in uh, verse 28, and I, uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, well, the, the two demon-possessed men that are healed. I said, when he had come to the other side of the country of the garrisons, they were met there, two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could even pass that way. And suddenly they cried out saying, what would you have to do with us, Jesus, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? And I like actually in Mark's account, it says that actually the man, it, it, only, it was only a singular individual, it says that the man ran to Jesus and fell down and worshipped. See, that even in the midst of his torment, he could see the glory glistening light that was coming at him. And he's like, I just got to make my way. And then he says, uh, now, a good way off from there, he heard 
of the many swine that were feeding. So the demon, demons begged him, saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into that herd of swine. It's like something. And again, in Mark's account, it says that, what's your name? Not like Jesus didn't already know the name, you know what I'm saying? He didn't ask the question because he didn't know. He was just trying to show his friends, like, hey, sometimes we just need to inquire. Because inquiring minds want to know. And it says that as the, the same thing. He, he, he said, just, just, I don't want to leave the territory. See, because that's part of it is that demons have been given territory where they're supposed to hang out. And so they're like, please don't send us away. Just the swine. How about sending us into the swine? And Jesus is like, yeah, we can do that. It says, and he said to them, go. And when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine. And suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea, and perished in the water. Now, as far as I know, this is the first case of suicide uh, in the Bible. And in fact, I think it's the only case of suicide in the Bible. It says, and then those that had kept the... the they had kept them fled, and they went into the city, and they told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed man. And behold, the whole city came up to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart. And actually, I like in Mark's gospel, because it says that when they saw the man that was demon-possessed, he was sitting there in his right mind, completely healed. Now, that wasn't just a five-second thing. You're like, these guys run off, and now they're back. It was like, I'm guessing it might have been an hour or two. I'm reading between the lines, okay, when I say this. I believe that while those guys ran back into the city and shared, like, this guy, he put demons into our pigs and messed our whole business up. You know what I mean? And, and so while he's there, Jesus is now ministering to this one that was so bound up with demonic presence. And I believe that as he just pulled him in closer, and he said, you know, I remember when you were just a little boy and that injustice that happened to you that caused that first demon to come in. Well, we're going to heal that right now. Oh, and then, and then the other thing, too. And we're just going to, we're just going to, we're going to go through your soul, and we're just going to heal those layers. We're going to hear those, those pieces, those parts, and we're going, to, we're going to bring it into oneness so that you understand who you are. And I believe that there was this whole counseling of God's grace and mercy as he began to speak the heart and the identity of who Jesus created this one to be. And too often we write people off when the reality is like, God's going, well, let's go. Because this is the one that I created before the foundations of the world to carry my presence in my heart. And so Jesus heals this guy. And then they come back and they're like, what? How is this guy in his right mind? This doesn't even make sense. Because a moment ago, he was like, <laughs> like the, the Tasmanian devil. Some of you know who that is, but others, it's okay. You can go watch Bugs Bunny and you can see him. So. But to me, that, that's just God's heart, as he longs to make people whole. He longs to heal every facet of who we are. And many times, I mean, if we're struggling with, with demonic oppression, we just need to get the clutter out of the way so that God come and heal the innermost being of who we are. It's his desire. It really is. I mean, Renee and I went through all kinds of deliverance. Tell you. I open my, my heart up to all kinds of crazy stuff from addiction to whatever, you know what I mean? And, and the reality is that every time I did those things, it, it was a doorway for the devil. And then God in his kindness comes in and he saves my spirit man. And my spirit man's going, Wah. my soul's going, oh, you know, there's this inner battle going, oh, you know, inside, you know what I'm saying? But then when God comes in with his love, again, we know that his perfect love, it casts out all fear. And those things that would want to hold us even to generational things and even hold us to what well, I've always been. You know what I mean? It's like, no, actually, I'm a new creation. You know, that's the beauty of baptism, right? <laughs> Rise up as new. And to me, that's, that's, the, that's the quickening, that's the awakening, that's the reality of what happens to our spirit, man, right? But then Paul goes on to say, oh, and by the way, this is a journey. And there, with this journey, you should work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so part of it in the journey is that we run into these roadblocks that get in the way in our soul. 
from being fully restored and healed of what God wants to do, right? And so that, that's been my story. All kinds of stuff. And yet I'm so thankful for God. See, he's faithful. Just stick with the process. Don't run. See, and that's what the enemy wants you to do. Is he wants you to flee rather than him flee. And he wants you to flee with him. I got better things for you. No, he doesn't. Kill, steal, destroy. But Jesus said, if I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. Just stick with the king. You know what I'm saying? And he's got these arms that are open wide. And that whenever the devil tries to push you in a direction that's contrary to those arms open wide, just push him out of the way and run to the arms of the Father. Man, because he'll restore you. He will make you new. He will cause your destiny to be unlocked so you can walk in the fullness of what he had in mind when he created you before the foundation of the world. It's so amazing. And so in the, in the midst of the journey, realize, hey, we're being transformed from glory to glory. So just embrace another level of glory today. Transformation. Let's go. You know what I'm saying? And over in uh, chapter 9, it says then, um, Jesus forgives and heals the paralytic. And so he got out into the boat and he crossed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. At once, some of the scribes said within themselves, this man's blasphemes. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, see, Jesus was a mind reader. That's a gift of the Spirit, man. I tell you, that's one of the ways we can actually hear God. We can actually hear people's thoughts. Now, I'm, not, I'm not talking some new age nonsense. I'm just saying Jesus heard their thoughts. They didn't say anything. They were in, in their own mind. He was like, Man, you guys are so messed up. But let me just show you who I am, and let me just show you the reality of the kingdom that I come from. He says, and and why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power On the earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, rise up, take your bed, and go to your house. It's beautiful. And to me, that's what the power of forgiveness does. That many times it's our own holding on to unforgiveness and holding on to bitterness that actually hinders us from receiving the fullness of what God wants to do, even in the way of a healing and a miracle. And that when we learn from his kindness and goodness washing over us and overwhelming us, it's in that place that all of a sudden we begin to see how good he is and how much he's forgiven us, right? I mean, because one who's been forgiven much loves much. I mean, how many here have been forgiven of anything? Shabarakatoranamate. Oh, I'm so thankful for forgiveness, right? And that when we learn that very attribute of what we've been forgiven of, that we, when we in turn then forgive those that have offended us and hurt us and done mis, mis, just wrong things, right? When we learn to forgive, and part of that learning is just receiving more of his love. And sometimes even our own, and I won't even call it my own because it was never mine, bitterness and unforgiveness, that moment that we release that to the Lord actually as an offering because of what he did for us, that when he laid himself out on that cross to forgive and destroy the works of the devil, to forgive and destroy the works of sin and iniquity once and for all, that 
when we begin to see how majestic and how amazing this man Christ Jesus is, and that you allow that love to apprehend you from such a non-religious way that you just allow the cascading reality of heavenly places to just infiltrate and wash over you, it unlocks your heart. And we've seen it many times where, where there's been shame and guilt and even just self-hatred and unforgiveness and an unwillingness to even forgive yourself. It's like in those places where we just are led by his presence and by the spirit. And we hear just what the Lord wants to do and you begin to address those areas. Again, God doesn't reveal and unveil because he's trying to condemn you. Rather, he came to save us and give us that abundant life. And so even as things are being revealed to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call out those things from this place. But if it's you and I praying down here, let's go on a journey, man. Let's get free. And just knowing even that place and that position. And that when we allow, again, the truth of his forgiveness to come in to release us so that we can forgive and we can release the bitterness and things that have just wrapped around our heart. Man, many times, especially people that have chronic things. Fibromyalgia and Crohn's disease and different things like that are all, many autoimmune diseases are, are wrapped in some kind of, uh, could be bitterness, could be, could be unforgiveness. And it's interesting because many times in, in autoimmune, I find that, that it's usually an inability to forgive yourself. And it's rooted in self-hatred. It's rooted in condemnation rather than the glorious life that Jesus promised. Now, I'm telling you, we're going to go to another level in this. I mean, autoimmune diseases are going to be healed. Crohn's disease, gone. Rheumatoid arthritis, gone. That's where we're going. We just need to have faith to believe that. And we'll do this one last story, and then I, I, want, I want us to be praying here, okay? And this is now in verse 18. And it says, while he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came to worship him, saying, my daughter has just died. But come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. See, that, that's interesting to me, because this guy was, was Jairus. He would have been a ruler of the synagogue. And so he would have been a man that knew the scripture. You know what I mean? He just knew it. And yet... He had seen time and time again that whenever Jesus came through and he heard about just the testimonies that when Jesus would come through, people would just get healed. And so he, he just has this, this faith in him. And so Jesus arose and he followed him. And so did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I may touch his garment I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said to her, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And that woman was made well from that very hour. And I find, again, that the same way that the leper was an outcast, so was this woman. Because it was 12 years of, 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 of menstruating, never nonstop. And she'd been to all the doctors, spent all of her money. And in, in, in the mix of all of that, she's just like, I don't know what to do anymore. But she heard that every time Jesus would come through, the miracle signs and wonders that would happen. And so she sees Jesus come afar. Now, isn't that interesting? Because Jesus was going somewhere else. And sometimes we can get so busy that we actually miss an opportunity to be Jesus, to be those hands, to be those feet. It's amazing. Now, it, what, she, what she saw, that when Jesus came by, she saw this, this, this garment she said, if, 
it wasn't like he want, she wanted to touch the bottom of his robe in his she wanted to touch the hem of the prayer shawl. And that when we look at the prayer shawl, it has these tassels. And the tassels actually represented the promises of God. So what she said, if I can touch the promises that are on him, that are flowing out of him, I can be healed. You know, in the blue is the revelation and the, and the promises of his scripture. and the white is the purity of his word. You know, in Malachi, it says that, and the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wing. And, and many times, that's actually what these were called. They were the wings of the garment. That he would arise with healing in his wings. And I'm telling you, he's arising today with healing in his wings. And that every one of us that needs a healing touch, whether that's physically in your body, whether that's in your mind or in your soul, in your spirit, the son of righteousness, the king of glory, is arising with healing in his wings. And to me, you don't need to just stop at the promises. Go for the face. That's what I so loved about King David is he was, oh, I just want the face. And it's interesting because the word face and the word presence are actually the same word in the Hebrew is that we can go for the promises or we can go for the presence. And not that she stopped short because she was reaching out. She had faith. And because of that faith, that's why Jesus then immediately goes, wait a minute. And one of the other gospels that actually says, uh, who touched me? And the disciples are like, uh, Jesus, we're going through like a crowd. What do you mean who, who touched you? I mean, everyone's touching you. He goes, no, 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 no. Someone touched me and the virtue of heaven left me. Someone touched me. And what I find interesting that even in the case with this woman is that she touched Jesus. He didn't touch her, and yet he did. And because she was reaching for the promises, knowing that what? That our God is healer. And if I can just touch those promises, I will be healed. And then Jesus finally, all of a sudden, he locks eyes with her and says, daughter. Immediately, it's about restoration because she'd been an outcast for 12 years. She was considered unclean and like the leper, had to make that announcement as she walked through. She was not allowed to go worship in the synagogue or in the temple either because of her uncleanness. So the world would say. And Jesus said, ah, watch this. And he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. I'm telling you, faith is powerful. Faith is powerful. And that some of us just, just need to get a little closer, knowing that he will not forsake you. But as you reach out with your heart and just allow that hunger for his righteousness, for his goodness, for his healing to come upon you. He's faithful. And when Jesus had come, and I'm going to go into the rest of this here. And when Jesus had come into the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. Now, again, they had professional wailers, mourners. They would, like, like literally, they would come and they'd be professionally mourned. I mean, whatever. I like that. And the noisy crowd. You see, it wasn't, even a, it wasn't even a sound that was attractive. It was a sound of death. It was a sound that, she's dead, there's no hope. But when Jesus came into the ruler's house, he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. He said to them, make room. This girl's not dead but sleeping. It says that they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in. And he took her by the hand. And the girl rose. And the report 
of this went out everywhere into the land. Both of these took a dimension of faith. One, it was, it was the rulers going, I have enough faith that he, I think Jesus could do this. I, I know that he's done all kinds of miracles. He can come raise my daughter from the dead. That's the cool thing about Jesus. He messed up every funeral. He just did. He was good at it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, here comes Jesus again. Ah, yeah, I'm alive and well. All right, sweet. That, and I tell you, that, that's, I want to mess up more funerals. Let's just put it that way. Especially when someone dies prematurely. Because we give too much credit to the devil and call it the sovereignty of God. No, nope, there's a devil that hates you and is completely against you. And if he's against you and God before you, who can be against you? But in both of these cases, there was a dimension of faith. Now, it wasn't the faith of the dead girl. Just saying. And I've heard that one too. You just need to have more faith. And I'm thinking, no, this one's on me. We've had that many times, different times we've prayed for people. And pastors and leaders who just have, to be honest, poor doctrine and teaching on just faith and the simplicity that is he is God's will to heal. Make excuses when things don't happen. And rather than it causing it to be a place of intimacy where you can be drawn up into the updraft of his love to get the download of why, when I prayed for that person, didn't they get healed? And then you come with a revelation, and next time, it happens. And to me, that, that is the beauty, though, is that this woman... For 12 years, spent all of her money. And I find it interesting that actually Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. And so a marking moment. It's, 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 an, it's an apostolic number. It's a, it's a government of God number. It's a, it's a ruling and stepping into the rule and the authority of God. And both of them did that day. And see, that's what happens that when we become conduits to his love and we back up his word with signs, wonders, and miracles, I would say he actually backs us up, right? We just need to have faith to do it. We, we had a really... Again, so many cool miracles, but there was this crusade that we were doing actually in Ghana, Africa. And I mean, it was a violent, wicked storm that had come against and actually postponed the, the crusade for about an hour. But we contended and prayed because we knew that God wanted to do something that evening. And so then the rains finally subside and then our, our team gets the, 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 the PA system and everything's set up. And I mean, there's these bats and it was just like, you could just feel the wickedness in the air. And part of where we were doing this, because one, one, of, our, one of our girls, Cassie, um, was uh, back when Renee and Cassie were actually in Ghana. She, she just kept feeling led to go down to this one particular part of this village. And she would walk and she's like, man, it just feels so oh, down here. So she finally asked one of the girls, like, why do I feel this? And she said, well, this is the place where, where human sacrifice would take place. And now it's sacrifice of animals. And she was like, oh, we need to do something here. And when she was sharing just her insight in the, in, in the midst of her, her prayer walks, we said, we're going to do a crusade right on that spot. Now, the devil didn't want us coming. I'm telling you, a storm that was so wicked tried to stop us. Then all of a sudden, like bats and just these things. Again, the bats and of themselves aren't evil, but I'll tell you what what was going on right then and there. Uh, there was curses and things that were being released in the atmosphere to distract us and keep us from what God wanted to do. And so we finally released just, you know, we, we preached the gospel and a whole bunch of people come up and get saved. And I mean, miracle signs and wonders, the blind see. And I mean, it was just so cool. People coming into the kingdom of heaven for the first time. That in a place where humans were sacrificed, the greatest sacrifice of all, Jesus Christ shows up. <laughs> And people get born again. Now, there was this woman that came up. And she came up, and she's very pregnant. 
like nine months pregnant. And she comes up to Renee and I, and she says, um, I've been cursed, and my baby's died. They're taking it out on Tuesday. I'm like, oh, okay. And she said, I'm, I'm next. That when the, baby, when the baby's dead, the curse is also that I'll be dead too. And so we're like, well, I don't think so. I don't think so at all, actually. Because the same power that raised Christ from the dead is now inside of me and is about to be inside of you. And the thing is, she just got born again. She was one that came forward to be born again. So, boom, the spirit's alive and well, and every wicked, ter- cursed eye and spell, shamora. You know what I'm saying? And so, as Renee and I prayed, we just began to speak life into the womb, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. This little feet started kicking like you can't believe. And five days later, can we just put the picture of uh, myself and Gita Day and Jonathan? This is Jonathan right here, man. See, the devil thought he killed him. But Jesus promised life. And mom and baby are doing great, even yet this day. She's had a couple more children now since that time. But to me, the blessing and the power of God always overcomes the curse. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God's desire is that we would heal the sick that we would cleanse the leper, that we would raise the dead, that we would cast out demons because we've so freely received the majestic (sighs) glory of his presence that we in turn then get to give it away. And to me, that's the privilege that we have as sons and daughters. Again, we weren't meant to contain, but to give it away, to be dispensers of kingdom glory. Can we just stand up? Father, I thank you for each one in this room that you've anointed and that, God, that you're you're even now just changing mindsets and just shifting things over minds and over hearts. I decree and declare the revelation of your love and of your light just to be released now in Jesus' name. And I declare, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that each son and daughter in this room today, God, would just be unlocked and released. And just the Lord saying, I've given you permission to be about my Father's business. I've given you permission to heal the sick. To bring cleansing, to bring liberty, to open prison doors, to restore sight to the blind. And that as you enforce the reality of the victory of Calvary and the finished work of the cross, I declare that this is the generation that as the Spirit comes with a fresh outpouring, God, that there will be a release and unlocking of what is possible with you. And that even with our natural eyes, when we see the impossibilities, let us see with our spirit eyes, moved with compassion to break the chains, to release the truth of who you are, the essence and the nature, the reality that you are the Lord God that heals And that by your stripes, Jesus, the same way that you took sin, you took sickness, and you took disease, I declare today in the name of Jesus Christ the truth. The truth that you really are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that you're healing is available right here, right now. I thank you for your nearness, Holy Spirit. That you'd minister to each one. That you'd pour your boldness into each one. 
And I say, let this week be full of divine encounters. For you to show up, Jesus, and show off. We thank you, Papa. And as Steve was speaking, I believe God's going to sharpen our mind and ability to put the noise of the crowd or the noise of the world of doubt and unbelief and put it outside. Jesus told the crowd outside. So in, our, in, our, in the space in our minds, in the space in our minds, we are putting the noise of the world, the majority noise of doubt and unbelief. And we're saying, I'm putting you outside. And so, God, I pray that grace upon each one of us, when the doubt and unbelief comes into our mind, that we would say, no, I'm putting you outside. You have no place in this mind. So, God, I thank you that doubt and unbelief has no place. And, God, I thank you even over this house this morning. I say doubt and unbelief will be checked at the door, and it won't be allowed in here because this is a place of faith. God, I thank you that we're going to continue to grow from faith to faith, glory to glory. And there's going to continue to be an increase. So we leave the, the noise of the world, the clamor of the crowd outside. And we say, faith arise. Faith arise. Faith arise in my heart and in my mind. Faith arise. Doubt and belief, you're out. I put you out. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says this. Now, faith is. So when is it? Now. It's now. Now faith is the substance. I'm telling you, if you want to be addicted to any substance, let it be faith. <laughs> Woo, come on. I'm telling you, it's way better. I, just, I know. I really know. Faith substance. Is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders ordained a good testimony. See, it's all about that, isn't it? Shoo. And by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And so, Lord, we just say, let that substance of faith begin to permeate us now. The tangible weightiness of faith, let it be released now in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let me just read one more verse only because I like the word. But without, listen, this is really good. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's got rewards for every one of you this week. And you're going to discover fresh dimensions of faith. Your heart's going to be expanded and increase in your capacity for love and for faith. And just lay a hold of that substance. Woo! I'm telling you, it's so good. And I heard someone repeat over here, he is a rewarder. Like when little phrases like that, like let that phrase be like something, God, you are a rewarder. Teach me. Let me see you and understand you as you are a rewarder. You know what I mean? Sometimes we can have this image of God like somehow he's holding back on us. But that's not truth. And so we want truth to permeate our hearts and minds. God, you are a rewarder. And I, I, if you'll be courageous enough, I felt like there's another... Um, point that when Steve was speaking and the woman who touched the hem of his garment and um, it is, you know, it's like you touched my heart. Who touched me? Now if that moment, as Steve was speaking that, if something inside of you went you know, just like in a good way, just like you just felt something. Can you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay, just keep your hands up. Just keep them up. God's going to t continue to touch because he is bringing another la layer of freedom and an understanding. You touch the heart of God. You touch the heart of God. And any God, we break any shame of even a past season or shame that would, that would hinder God. Anything that you want to do because the reality is God is speaking right to your heart. You touch my heart. You touch the heart of God. And that reality is bigger and stronger than any shame of the past or any generational stronghold. That word is stronger and will not return void. You touch his heart. You touch his heart. 
that truth remains. Anything that wages war against that, God, right now we're asking you, wash over it with your spirit. Just wash over it with truth. Thank you, Lord. And there would be a deep reality established here today. You touch the heart of God. I touch the heart of God. With our faith, when we reach for those promises. Because he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him.